empty homes officers working directly with owners of empty homes to bring their properties back into use, particularly for affordable homes. Thank you, Minister. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, later today, I'll be leaving uh, and travelling to France, uh, where I'll be attending the series of events at Bayou Cemetery in Sword Beach to mark the 70th anniversary of the DD landings. Uh, these fitting events remind us of the sacrifice of those who died during the biggest amphibious assault in military history, and of course they remind us of the necessity to never forget that sacrifice made by those who fell in conflict. Joanne Lamont. Can I thank the First Minister very much for that information, and our thoughts will be with all of those for whom it is a, a particularly painful day, but it is a proud um, opportunity to commem commemorate a very important time in our history. Last week, we found out the First Minister doesn't know what it will cost to set up a separate Scottish state. This week, we found out he doesn't know how he'll pay for his promises to those in greatest need of welfare. Can the First Minister now reveal what's he going to tell us next week he doesn't know? First Minister. Uh, well, what I can say to Joanne Lamont, uh, as we published uh, the framework of uh, an independent Scotland in the white paper described as Scotland's future, if she consults uh, Chapter 6 and Chapter 10, she'll see the extensive uh, information that was presented on how we go about producing a modern democracy in Scotland. But above all, she'll see the arguments of why Scotland, eh, as a, a modern democracy, will be able to build a more prosperous and, above all, a more equal country for all our citizens. Yeah. 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 Joanne I think most of us looking at the White Paper found there was a lot of questions answered that we weren't asking, and none of the main questions that really mattered addressed at all. <laughs> now, last week, my colleague Neil Bibby asked Aileen Campbell a simple question, what her childcare policy would cost. She said, and I quote, independence is the answer. That, that is exactly right. We ask for a figure and we get back a statement of nonsense. Every single policy the First Minister unveils to try to persuade Scotland to vote yes is uncosted. Either he has a plan to reverse the rules of arithmetic, or he has no intention of delivering them. The IFS tells us that after independence, the First Minister can't deliver what we have now, but still the uncosted promises tumble from his lips. Let me put it another way. When is the First Minister going to announce a money tree for every garden in Scotland? First Minister. Well, can I, can I firstly remind Joanne Lamont what we've already delivered as far as childcare in Scotland is concerned? We inherited 412.5 hours for three and four year olds. That's moving this year to 600 hours. Yeah. Uh, a very substantial achievement. Uh, we are going to move to the, uh, uh, for workless uh, households for two year olds uh, this year and over the next two years. That's a very substantial advance. Uh, of course, the Labour Party, if I remind you, in January said that wasn't enough. Yeah. Uh, indeed, so desperate were they to make that point, they were prepared to sacrifice school meals for yeah. primaries yeah. one to three in their vote uh, in January. But they said within the consequentials, there was the ability to move immediately to 50 per cent coverage for two-year-olds. Uh, we now find that these consequentials don't even approach what would have happened if we'd followed Joanne Lamont's yeah, advice. Exactly. So uh, I think people looking at the considerable advances that have been made by this government within the restricted budget and the austerity programme yes. coming down from Labour and Tory at Westminster will see a track record of substantial success, which will give people every confidence as we move forward for independence and controlling our own finances will be able to do even more for the families of Scotland. Joanne Lamont. This, of course, is the Scottish Government that decided it wasn't in the public interest for us to know what their policy on childcare was going to cost. It's simply an insult to people who every day are concerned about the question of childcare. But let's take the key out of the First Minister's economics and listen to some real economists. The Institute of Fiscal Studies said this week, and I quote, Scottish Government ministers have not always been as careful as official Scottish Government publications when referring to figures. They say Nicola Sturgeon in particular is bad with figures. The IFS says, 
The IFS says that the deficit in an independent Scotland would be £1,000 more for every person in Scotland. But that doesn't stop the First Minister, Order. for he has a referendum to win. So we've got more childcare, increased welfare. What's next week's offer? Whatever people want, and it won't cost you a coin. Why? Why? When the IFS says an independent Scotland couldn't afford what we have now, does the First Minister try... When the IF says... When the, IF, when the IFS says an independent Scotland couldn't afford what we have now, does the First Minister try to dupe the people of Scotland by offering things he knows he can't deliver? First Minister. Can I, I remind uh, the Labour Party it was Joanne Lamont who said we couldn't afford the social gains of devolution yeah. and set up a cuts exactly. commission yeah. to examine them. I haven't heard from Arthur Midwinter for some considerable time, but I am fully expecting that report to emerge and tell us what Joanne Lamont wants to do. Is she going to sacrifice free tuition in Scotland? Is she going to sacrifice free transport, free personal care for the elderly? The Labour Party have had all of these social gains of devolution in their sights. They were part, as we remember, of the something for nothing society that Joanne Lamont says wasn't sustainable. And I believe that people seeing the track record and the social democratic gains of devolution will recognise that in this government we have a government with ambition for Scotland yeah. that knows if you match and marry the natural resources of this country to the talents of our people, then we can create a better and more prosperous and more equal society. It's about having confidence in the ability of Scotland yeah. to govern its own affairs like any other nation. It's like stopping talking down the country. It's like some sort of recognition from the Labour Party that they couldn't run Scotland when times were good in fiscal terms. Who would trust them to run Scotland now? And some sort of dawning realisation that after almost a century of political dominance in Scotland, the Labour Party lose election after election. Yeah. And the reason they lose it is they have no ambition yeah. for the people and the country of Scotland. Joanne Lamont. Order. Order. Yes, Mr. Minister, a serious question about the cost of his own proposals, and we are treated. We are treated to the First Minister's greatest hits over the last two years. It's about time he was serious about the job he's supposed to be doing, because if the symbol for the United Kingdom is the pound sign. The symbol for Alex Salmon's separate Scotland is crossed fingers. Fingers crossed, not in the hope, not in the hope that things might work out well, but fingers crossed in the hope that the people of Scotland will be daft enough to believe a word the First Minister says. Because most people, most people in Order. the real world no, you need to know what things cost. So what we've got, childcare, uncosted, not even an attempt to find out what the figures would be. Pensions, John Swinney doubts he can afford them, but still we get an assertion that they will be better. And now welfare, big cynical problems to those in greatest needs and not a clue how to pay for them. Now I agree, I agree with the First Minister when he says the people of Scotland are talented, ambitious and bright. But where I disagree with him... Order. Order. It's not always in evidence, but however, I do believe that people in Scotland are talented, ambitious and bright. But where I disagree with him is the key quality his plans rely on. His unerring belief that the people of Scotland are gullible and will believe anything that he says. <laughs> First Minister, order, well, First Minister. Let's have agreement that the people of Scotland are talented, ambitious and bright. Yeah. It just that this side believes that these talented, ambitious and bright people are capable of making a success of running our own country. <laughs> now, 
I don't think Joanne Lamont should have described our proposals for welfare in the way she's done. I, I think, for example, the recommendation to increase the carer's allowance from 61.35 a week to 72.40 a week by £575 to, to 57,000 individuals uh, in Scotland. I, I think that is a substantial investment uh, in Scotland's uh, future. Uh, and I think that the costing of that policy is very, very important. And the costing of that policy is £32.9 million pounds a year. Now, I believe we should afford that. And incidentally, uh, Mike Brewer, a research fellow at the Institute of Fiscal Studies, was a member of the expert working group on welfare which produced that policy. So I think that commitment and that recommendation is an important declaration of faith uh, in the work done by carers in Scotland, which people across this chamber should support and aspire to. And yes, it's going to cost £32 million, but in my estimation, it's £32 million well spent to help these people. And I would have a care about the company that Joanne Lamont is keeping. Now, we know that Danny Alexander exaggerated the cost, the set-up cost of an independent Scotland by a factor of 12 times. We know that because the source Professor Dunleavy told us that, uh, and we know that he did that, and they've been running from that reality uh, ever since. Uh, but I've been looking at what Dali Alexander has been saying about his allies' plans. Uh, for example, Danny Alexander earlier this year said Labour's new borrowing bombshell will pile another £166 billion of extra borrowing onto the debt mountain left by their catastrophic mismanagement of the UK economy. Now, all I'm saying to Joanne Lamont, presumably she doesn't believe that Danny Alexander is correct in his assessment of Labour's borrowing bombshell. So why on earth should she believe he's correct in his assessment of the cost of an independent Scotland? <laughs> Professor Dunleavy doesn't believe it. We don't believe it. And above all, the Scottish people don't believe it. Question two. Ruth Davidson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he will next meet the Prime Minister. First Minister. Uh, no plans, near future. Ruth Davidson. Presiding Officer, we already know that the impartial and independent Institute of Fiscal Studies has concluded. <laughs> it is when it suits the First Order. Minister. Has concluded that Scotland would have an £8.6 billion black hole in its finances in the first year of independence. But it's not just them. These are similar findings to work that has been done by other impartial and independent bodies, such as the Centre for Public Policy for the Regions and Citigroup. And it's part of a trend. On the one hand, expert groups with sober analysis of the facts, and on the other hand, the SNP with shrill assertions and bully boy bluster. So I'm asking, so I'm asking in all seriousness, why does the First Minister think that all of these people are wrong, but only he is right? First Minister. Well, uh, I've got a range of uh, quotations of independent uh, experts who, who make the point uh, that Scotland is not just a sustainable country in economic terms, but a highly prosperous country, and in many cases more prosperous uh, than the, the United Kingdom in terms of the potential we have in the economy of people, even standard and poor's not known for their sunny optimism uh, in the economic outlook uh, for various countries, pointed out that Scotland would qualify for their highest economic assessment even without uh, North Sea oil uh, and gas. Can I say that the thing characteristic which is common uh, to the assessments that, uh, that Ruth Davison quotes is they are based on the OBR figures. Now, if you base something on the same figures, uh, then, of course, you come up with the same uh, conclusion. I put it to Ruth Davidson that the track record of the OBR uh, is such that I think we should have confidence in looking at the oil industry in Scotland at the present moment, that our estimates in terms of revenues in 2016-17 are a great deal more reasonable than those of the OBR, since we don't assume a collapse in oil prices to less than $100 a barrel. We don't assume that the Department of Energy and Climate Change is right either. We don't assume it goes up to 130 We assume it's $110 a barrel. And we assume we follow the industry estimates or in terms of the increased investment over the next few years, and that will result in a substantial increase in production. It's what Sir Ian Wood pointed out in his recent report as well. So if we follow the industry estimates, followed incidentally by 80% 
of the companies who reflected in the Oil and Gas UK survey recently. Then that is a reasonable estimate to put forward, as opposed to an OBR figures which rely on the Department of Energy and Climate Change when it comes to production, but disregard the forecasts when it comes to price. That is why we put forward a reasonable perspective on which we will have a grand starting position for an independent Scotland. But the policies that we follow will be the policies that grow the economy, increase the welfare and the economic health of the country, yeah. and above all, bring about a more equal and just society. Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, I am delighted that the First Minister brought up oil and the quote of reasonable estimates, because it's not just independent and impartial experts who take issue with the First Minister, but it's his own advisers. Professor Andrews Hughes Hallett, who wrote the First Minister's Fiscal Commission report, who is a key member of the First Minister's Council of Economic Advisers, described by the First Minister as, and I quote, the most formidable intellectual firepower ever to have tackled Scottish economic underperformance. So we know that the First Minister thinks he's a big deal. He revealed to the Finance Committee just yesterday that the First Minister's oil figure is wrong. Professor Hughes Hallett wrote that it would be reasonable to expect North Sea oil revenues to rise to four and a half to five billion between 2016 and 2020. So let's just remind ourselves that only last week, after months of stalling, the Scottish Government claimed that that figure would be seven billion pounds a year. So Alex Salmond's oil advisor says five billion, Alex Salmond says seven billion. It is a total farce. The First Minister has wildly overestimated beyond the expectation of any, any rigorous analysis in order to try and plug the gaping holes in his white paper. First Minister, Professor Hughes Hallett, your own man says you're £2 billion pounds out. Is he wrong as well? First Minister. Can I point out, Ruth Davison, that the Conservative Party have been predicting the demise of the North Sea oil industry since the 1980s? Uh, and Professor Hughes Hallett is voting yes in the referendum because he believes that the Scottish economy will be better managed and governed from Scotland. And the scenarios pointed out in the papers we released last week, based on the price assumption uh, I've already spelt out, and the production and investment Order. in line with industry expectations, are a great deal more robust uh, than the OBR's estimates. But you wanted independent experts. Well, I've got one or two here. John Order. Howell, Chair of Petroleum Geology at Aberdeen University, presumably somebody who knows something about the oil industry and its future production levels. With upwards of 35 billion barrels equivalent still in the North Sea and surrounding waters and an annual production of 600 million, there are at least 40 years of production with significant yet to find resources which may be added. I merely offer this to Ruth Davidson because Professor Howell is in well in advance of the production estimates that we are making, which indicates the caution of the Scottish Government's forecast and how we look forward to seeing the results of that in terms of the economy of Scotland. Order, can we just the last settle down? Final difference, First Minister. which perhaps indicates why a majority. First Minister, can you sit down? Can we please hear the First Minister without the barracking? Everybody needs to be heard in this chamber, and I'm determined that's going to happen. First Minister. Which is why in the Aberdeen and Ch Grampian Chambers of Commons survey, a survey of 700 firms in the industry, more of these companies believe that independence will benefit the industry than those who believe it won't benefit the industry. So isn't that why? The industry and the people believe that having these huge quantities of oil and gas in our economy and off our waters is an advantage for Scotland, like it is for every other oil-producing yeah, country, absolutely. as opposed to the crushing liability that the Tory party have told us it is for the last 40 years. Supplementary, Neil Findlay. This week, a large group of women, including several from my region, attended the Petitions Committee calling for the suspension of polypropylene mesh implants fitted to treat pelvic prolapse. Given the appalling injuries experienced by these women, will the First Minister instruct the Cabinet Secretary for Health to issue new guidance that would have the effect of suspending the use of this product and until, until an inquiry is held into the safety of it? First Minister. Uh, 
As the member should know, the, the matter is under serious consideration. On, on this matter, we intend to move in conjunction with the other health departments uh, across these islands. But what the health sector would be more than prepared to do uh, is directly meet with the, the women concerned and explain the consideration that has been given to what is a, a fundamental and serious issue. Question three, Alison McInnes. Minister, what recent discussions the Scottish Government has had with Police Scotland regarding the use of stop and search? First Minister. Well, the, the, the Scottish Government meets regularly with Police uh, Services Scotland to discuss uh, a, a range of issues, including stop and search. The most recent meeting uh, took place on the 15th of May. I can I say to Alison McInnes, uh, Alison McInnes that stop and search is an important tool for the police in the prevention and detection of crime? The SPA's report acknowledges the tactic makes a contribution towards the reduction of violence and antisocial behaviour. Scotland is a safer place for people to live since 2006-07, with violent crime down by almost half, eh, and crimes of handling offensive weapons down by 60 per cent since 2006-07. Of course, we welcome the Scottish Police Authority's scrutiny and review of Stop and Search, published last week. Police Scotland have established a new National Stop and Search Unit to ensure a consistency of approach to this important policing tactic to tackle violent crime and antisocial behaviour. The First Minister has spent the year saying the policy cuts crime. The police authority says there is no robust evidence that it does so. Reports show hundreds of children aged even under six have been searched here in Scotland. Isn't it time for the First Minister to move and change the law? Can you tell me how a child of six can give informed consent to a police search? First Minister. Well, you say that there is no uh, argument or support uh, that this policy helps prevent crime. I, I disagree fundamentally with Alice McInnes on this matter. But more importantly, some of her former colleagues in this chamber disagreed fundamentally. Robert Brown, the Liberal Democrat justice spokesperson in the last parliament, said on the 30th of June 2010, the single thing that deters people from criminal behaviour is the likelihood of being caught. The stop and searches carried out by Strathclyde police have been very effective. Now, that strikes me as a significant voice who understood the importance of, of stop uh, and search. The reduction in the carrying and use of weapons has been a huge major success for the police services of, of Scotland. Of course, it is right and proper that we review policy, and it is right and proper that the Scottish Police Authority does that, but not to believe that one of the aspects of the carrying of weapons by young people was their fear that other people were carrying weapons, is to neglect the overwhelming burden of evidence, the one supported by her former colleague and is supported by the vast majority of people who argue for this policy. But above all, in terms of the impact of stop and search and the reduction in the carrying of, of weapons. Uh, perhaps uh, Alison McInnes uh, should listen to some of the families of the, the victims of, of violent crime. Lisa McLean, sister of Barry McLean, killed in a knife attack in May 2011. The police get a lot of stick for the number of searches they are carrying out, but I am very supportive. If they can stop just one person from carrying a knife, then it's been worth it. Barry's death changed my life irreversibly. And at some point in this argument, perhaps Alice McInnes might face up to the fact that the victims of crime, the people who celebrate the fact that knife carrying in Scotland has been substantially reduced, the fact that our young people do not have the same fear that other people are carrying weapons, is a substantial advance for justice in this country. Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The SPA report estimates that with an average 15 minutes per stop and search, the whole process takes approximately 250,000 uh, police hours per year. Does the First Minister think that this is a proportionate use of police time? First Minister. Well, I, I, I see that uh, the Conservative Party is uh, ever uh, moving uh, aspect on, on this, but I think the police service is using proportionate methods in terms of putting forward uh, the stop and search policy. I, I think that the members should consider, along with Alison McInnes, that the statistics rather speak for themselves. Violent crime down by almost a half since 2007. Crimes of handling offensive weapons down by 60% since 2007. Now, when we had this debate in the 2011 elections, there was a whole variety of suggestions put forward to arrive at the sort of position that the police service had meant to arrive at. Some people suggested mandatory jail sentences. 
with an uncosted commitment which got into some confusion from the Labour Party spokesperson, which may well have resulted in the jailing of people who were carrying garden implements. I think as an alternative... Well, can I, can I refer the Labour Party to Richard Baker's famous interview during the election campaign? I think it is therefore a proportionate policy to have stop and search, which has contributed to this huge and welcome reduction in violent crime and the carrying of offensive weapons. Question four, David. Thank you. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government will respond to the report of the expert working group on welfare. Minister. Well, as we announced yesterday, the Government will take forward and consider carefully the recommendations made by the expert working group. These recommendations include increasing the carer's allowance, abolishing the current regime of sanctions, ending the 1% cap on benefits and up rate by the CPI, ending the current work capability assessment and establishing a national convention on social security. As the Chamber knows, we have already taken action on abolishing the bedroom tax, supported by the group in its report. It is a progressive and comprehensive report, and it indicates that with independence, Scotland can choose to take its own path in Social Security, rejecting the negative discourse which dominates the Westminster system and take substantial strides uh, to building a more equal society which values all of our citizens. Thank you, First Minister, for the answer. As we have heard, the report recommends an increase in carers' allowance to bring it into line with job seekers' allowance, something the Scottish Government has responded fairly to, which I am sure will be warmly welcomed by the many Scots eligible to receive this be uh, benefit. But I wonder if the First Minister agrees with me that the very fact the reports had to recommend this measure, along with consideration of a number of other carers-related measures, is a damning indictment of the treatment of a sector of society that we all of us owe so much to by successive Westminster governments. And shouldn't Labour, the Tories and Lib Dems be ashamed that rather than inheriting a fair welfare system from the UK, an independent Scotland will have to create one? First Minister. Well, you know, I, I was trying to, to, to reconcile the reaction on the, the, the Labour benches to the discussion we had on carers' allowance which strikes me as standout of one of the immediate and welcome recommendations of this report. I cannot see how, when we have had a recent discussion on the iniquity of the bedroom tax and a whole series of demands for this Government to provide the compensation against a Westminster measure, we cannot have the same unanimity or at least majority support for addressing the clear inequity towards Scotland's carers. Uh, it is spelt out in the report, it is spelt out the, the valuable contribution they make to Scottish society, and I hope when a, an SNP Government and I hope any government of an independent Scotland brings forward the carers' allowance proposals, which are required for us to control Social Security to bring them forward, then they'll meet with a massive resounding majority in this chamber, but above all, a massive resounding majority among the Scottish people. Question five, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister when the Vale of Leaven Hospital inquiry will be published. First Minister. Well, as Jackie Bailey will know, the, the handling of the inquiry is a matter for the Chair, Lord Maclean. That is important for a statutory inquiry. It is an independent public inquiry. It has been carefully examining all of the issues in a tragic and serious case. The inquiry has taken longer than anyone would have wanted and will be a source of frustration to many, not least to the families who are affected. Lord Maclean has advised he is currently considering the responses to the warning letters issued by the inquiry and will make any necessary amendments to his report. In keeping with the Inquiries Act 2005, Lord Maclean will advise the Scottish Government when this final process has been concluded and his timetable for publishing his report. The Health Secretary, Alec Neill, will inform Parliament of that timetable when it is finalised and provided by Lord Maclean. Can I thank the First Minister for his response? He will be aware that the first death from C. difficile at the Vale of Leven was in December 2007. Um, the public inquiry was granted after lobbying from the families in April 2009. It was due to report in May 2011, three years ago. Now, here we are, with no sign of publication, spiralling costs of almost £10 million, seven years after the families lost loved ones. Will the First Minister agree with me, and I hope that he will, that whilst we want to retain public inquiries, perhaps it is time to review how they can operate more effectively, not least so that the families can get answers? First Minister. I think there's a, a, a very fair point about the, 
uh, the length of time a number of public inquiries set up under the Inquiries Act, which, if I could remind Jackie Bailey, is a UK Act uh, in terms of the legislation. But she will understand the principle behind that Act makes the, the inquiry chair responsible for the timing and timescale of the inquiry. She will also understand that uh, in inquiries like the Vail Leaven or indeed the Penrose inquiry into to blood products where people have been casualties or have suffered fatalities and deaths of family members, there can be many issues which require a huge amount of scrutiny. Uh, Jackie Bailey will know and accept uh, that the fact that the inquiry in terms of looking at these uh, hugely serious issues uh, affecting Vail Leaven has not prevented serious action in the Scottish Health Service to reduce hospital-acquired infection. That has not awaited the recommendations of the inquiry. However, the recommendations and finding of the inquiry will be hugely important to the family members uh, concerned. I actually agree that we have to find a mechanism beyond the 2005 Inquiries Act of having inquiries which are both strenuously uh, pursued and independently chaired, but also within a timescale which can provide resolution and closure to those who are immediately affected, and also, in many cases, to provide recommendations about how we move forward on important public issues. Question six, Michael Badger. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government plans to order a public inquiry into the handling of the Edinburgh Trams project. First Minister. Well, I am sure that everyone in Edinburgh, indeed all over Scotland, will be delighted to see that the Edinburgh Trams are fully operational and carrying passengers. We cannot, however, lose sight of the considerable public concern over the conduct of the project, the disruption it has caused to households and businesses in the City of Edinburgh. Uh, I have therefore recommended to the Cabinet, and it has been decided, to establish a judge-led public inquiry to inquire into the Edinburgh Trams project, to establish why the project incurred significant overruns in terms of cost and timing, requiring, in particular, a considerable reduction in the original scope. It is important uh, that there are lessons to be learned from the conduct of the Edinburgh Trams project, and I think the course of action that we are proposing uh, will be a substantial assistance in doing that. Mark Biaggi. Can I take the, this opportunity to uh, welcome the First Minister's decision and announcement? All of us who opposed the tram project from the start as risky and over-engineered have been disappointed almost daily to be shown to be right. But does the First Minister agree with me that now that the trams are indeed rolling, if there is to be any faith from the public in future management or potential cost estimates for projects like this, we need to know for sure that these mistakes will never be repeated? First Minister. Well, can, can I say uh, two things? I, I welcome uh, Mark Obagi's welcome uh, for this. The decision that we have made uh, is to, uh, to have a non statutory uh, inquiry. Uh, we have done that for, for two reasons. One, perhaps what we have just been discussing in terms of, of timescale. Uh, and secondly, the Transport Minister has been assured by Edinburgh Council of full cooperation and full documentation of all aspects of the long process of the, the trams uh, project. So I, I think the, that gives us the opportunity to have a judge-led inquiry which will give us a proper examination and a public account uh, for what has happened to the trams project. One thing I would say in terms of the importance of doing this, because it is particularly important if any projects like it are being considered in the future that lessons are learned, but it is simply not the case that other major public projects in Scotland are running over time and over budget. The fourth replacement crossing, for example, the biggest infrastructure project in Scotland for a generation is being built on time and under budget. A total of £145 million worth of savings has been released from the fourth replacement crossing project since construction started in 2011. Uh, and that would be the case for the M74 completion in Dungregate Bypass, Simonton and Bog End Toll. Huge numbers of public investments in Scotland which are being completed on time and in many cases under budget. So it's important that we inquire and to see how the Edinburgh Trams project went astray. Uh, and I know that the whole chamber will await with great interest the findings of this inquiry. That ends First Minister's questions. We are now moving to members' business. Members who leave in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.